Okay. Seems like we're ready. So last time was about um, ascending pathways. Those that are going to provide information about what's going on out there in the world, at least somatosensory. So tactile sensation, pain, temperature. The whole purpose of the, the nervous system is, is to move our bodies around appropriately in space. So there has to be some sort of motor output um, in response to this input. That's really the ultimate function of the nervous system, is to move us around. We gotta go find food, we gotta go find mates. In order to do that, you have to be able to move around. Um, there are several descending pathways, as we can see up here. All the red ones are descending. The major tracks that you'll need to know here would be the pyramidal tracks, or your cortical spinal tract, cortical bulbar tract as well, but we'll touch on that later when we hit the brainstem. The cortical bulbar tract is going to terminate there rather than descending all the way into the spinal cord. Since we're in the spinal cord, we're only going to be talking about the cortical spinal tract. Now, you might have the impression that the cortex has everything all figured out and it sends a very refined uh, message to our low, lower motor neurons. Uh, but that's not really the case. There's still quite a bit of processing that goes on in the spinal cord. It gives a general message, some general plan of, of what to do. And the spinal cord figures out the actual actions that it should take based on additional input from the cerebellum and also from sensory input. There's, there's direct input to the spinal cord about limb position. It has a much better idea of what's actually going on out there in the world than the cortex does. So there's going to be some logic and some processing that occurs in the spinal cord. And that's going to occur in these spinal pattern generators right here. So we'll go over some of the circuitry down there in the spinal cord to explain why stretch reflexes work, how we override them in order to carry out movements, and how we're able to carry out just some simple alternating bilateral movements like walking without really having to put any thought into it because the spinal cord has it all figured out. Now there's of course additional input as well, some non-conscious descending tracks that are going to also refine our movements so we don't fall over, for example, or when there's a loud noise we immediately turn our head. When we bend over we can keep our head upright. There's a lot of things that we do that we don't have to think about. And that's going to be in part because of the spinal pattern generators, but also these other descending pathways that don't include the cortex and therefore are outside of our conscious awareness. The main one that we need to talk about, of course, arises from the cortex, the cortical spinal tract. We have our upper motor neurons, our lower motor neurons. And they're going to allow us to carry out our conscious movements. The things that we want to do whether it's typing your notes, having a snack, doesn't matter. You have some general plan here. We send that down to the spinal cord. Its circuitry selects the appropriate lower motor neurons to carry out whatever it is you want to do. So you end up putting food in your mouth rather than on your cheek. Two neurons in this track, sort of. Two motor neurons, anyway. There's the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron. <coughs> Pretty straightforward. The upper motor neuron is above the lower motor neuron. It's in the cortex. <clears throat> the motor portion of the cortex is going to be anterior to the sensory portion. This is pretty much true of the spinal cord, too. So your primary motor cortex is in front of your central sulcus there. Behind it, we have our sensory cortex. And there's some kind of a body map. There's a logical arrangement of motor neurons that correspond to different body structures. Now we're turning our body into just a strip, so you have to make some compromises. You can see here the face is over by the hands rather than near the shoulders. We do the best we can. But this allows neurons that are near each other in the cortex to more directly influence one another so that the area of the body that they're controlling 
is going to work in a coordinated fashion with itself. You want the neurons in the fingers to be able to communicate with the other neurons in the fingers so they can all work together. Putting them close to each other facilitates that. So we have a body map here. These are our upper motor neurons. In layer five of the cortex, as we'll talk about later, we have our large pyramidal neurons that are going to project downward. And they're going to create the cortical spinal tract. Up here, it's called the corona radiata. It's a radiating group of fibers. I guess it kind of looks like a crown. It's going to pass between the thalamus and the basal ganglia, forming the internal capsule. Down in the midbrain, it's going to be visible as the cerebral peduncles. This is still your cortical spinal tract. The cortical bulbar tract is going to terminate in the brainstem to innervate cranial nerve nuclei. Sometimes it's uh, going to be uh, ipsilateral, sometimes it's going to be uh, bilateral or contralateral. We'll talk about that later. The one that we care about is going to descend downward through the brainstem, and for the most part, it's going to cross at the bottom of the medulla when the pyramids end. So there's these two swellings in the front of the medulla that we call the pyramids, and that's why this is called the pyramidal tract, because it forms the pyramids. At the bottom, most of those fibers decusate or across the midline and innervate the contralateral lower motor neurons down there in the spinal cord. There's really uh, two cortical spinal tracts, one that's on the anterior portion of the spinal cord. It's called the anterior cortical spinal tract. This remains uncrossed until it reaches the level of the spinal cord where it finds its lower motor neurons and then it innervates them bilaterally. So it's going to remain uncrossed and cross down there at the level of the spinal cord. So we innervate both sides of our trunk. Generally, we don't want the two sides working independently. We want to move them in a coordinated fashion, but that's not true for our limbs. We want these to move independently. And we can do that because our lateral cortical spinal tract crosses up at the parental decusation and innervates the contralateral side independently. The fibers in your lateral cortical spinal tract aren't going to cross over and innervate the other side. They're simply going to hit those lower motor neurons down here in the anterior horn that are nearest to them. So we can see here that there's some organization in our anterior horn where the medial portion receives input from the anterior cortical spinal tract and then innervates the trunk. And the lateral portions of the anterior horn receive input from the lateral cortical spinal tract. So anterior is for trunk midline structures and the lateral cortical spinal tract out there at the side is for the regions of our body out there at the side, so your limbs. <coughs> the lower motor neurons are going to have two main types, as we've already covered, there's your alpha and gamma lower motor neurons, they'll hit different types of muscle fibers. The alpha lower motor neurons are a little bit larger, those are going to innervate the much larger extrafusal fibers and cause movements at joints. They're going to cause over changes in muscle length. Our skeleton moves around, our body moves around. The gamma lower motor neurons are going to innervate the intrafusal fibers of the muscle spindle and regulate the spinal reflexes. Here's our muscle spindle blown up uh, much larger than it is in real life. These are only about a centimeter long and flanking that we have our intrafusal fibers. There's where our gamma lower motor neurons are hidden. These are going to create motor units that's the motor neuron, and then all the muscle fibers that they innervate. They come in different sizes, they have different strengths. We've covered this before. This is all still true. We have our fast fatigable, fatigue resistant, and then our slow twitch fibers. The organization of the lower motor neurons is more pertinent for today. We all are well aware of the differences in the strength and fatigability of these different muscle fibers. We should also be aware of the organization of our lower motor neurons. So they're organized in different columns, just like we saw in the last slide, where there's medial portions innervating medial portions of the body, and the more lateral regions of the anterior horns are going to innervate lateral portions of the body. So that's our medial to lateral organization. There's also, of course, organization from head to toe. Those motor neurons in the more superior or rostral portions of the spinal cord innervate more rostral portions of the body, and down there in the lower regions of the spinal cord, they innervate lower areas of the body. So there's, there is some organization going on here, as you might expect. In different regions of the spinal cord, you'll see some swellings. 
you'll see the anterior horns kind of flare out a bit. And these would be the regions where we have additional body parts to innervate, like our limbs. Here we can see a portion of the thoracic spinal cord. We're really just going to be innervating the trunk. We have an additional swelling here. I do want you to take note of this lateral horn right here. Any idea what neurons might be there? <clears throat> What's up? Inner neurons. There's probably some in there, yeah. What's a special group of neurons, motor neurons that is, that arise in the thoracic and just upper lumbar spinal cord? I don't know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So our preganglionic sympathetic neurons are located there. And you get a little bit of swelling. So we make a bit of room because we're packing up more neurons there. This is the gray matter, this is the white matter. It's a myelin stain, so things are flipped. So in regions where you have additional neurons, you'll see these little bulges in the gray matter. Those lateral bulges correspond to the preganglionic sympathetic neurons. And you'll see something similar down there in the sacral spinal cord, spinal cord for the parasympathetic neurons. And then in regions where you're going to create nerves for your upper and lower limbs, you'll see these anterior horns <coughs> swell out substantially. And that's to accommodate the additional lower motor neurons for the upper or lower limbs. So there's our cortical spinal tract. That's about it. Two neurons. There's an upper motor neuron, there's a lower motor neuron. Nothing else to see here. <coughs> Now, of course, the spinal cord is a part of the central nervous system. So there's some degree of processing that goes on there. Um, there are inner neurons that are going to affect the communication between our upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons, or the sensory neurons and the lower motor neurons. So there's a few things that we need to go over before we can start to build some circuits and see how the spinal cord works. So you're excited, I am too. Let's hop into it. We'll start with our excitatory inner neurons since we're all so excited. Um, these are just what they sound like. They're inner neurons, so they're between two neurons and they're excitatory. They're gonna be dumping out glutamate in order to provide excitation. Their targets are kind of unique. They innervate one another. This is a positive feedback loop. They're going to be innervated by our upper motor neurons. Upper motor neurons can reliably activate lower motor neurons because we have a built-in amplifier. Here it is. You provide a little bit of excitation and once these start firing action potentials, they feed off of one another and continue to fire action potentials. So you get a burst of activity. They also target lower motor neurons. And this allows us to create a burst of activity so we get strong contraction of muscles. If you just had upper motor neuron to lower motor neuron, you wouldn't have nearly the same level of excitation as you would with this system where you get a burst of activity. So here's a burst in the tibial nerve and then here's the depolarization of the muscle that they get there. And the reason that we're getting a burst is because we have this reciprocal excitatory innervation here. Of course, this is going to turn itself off as they fire their burst of action potentials. Calcium accumulates. That stimulates calcium-gated potassium channels, and they move toward potassium reversal. So these are self-limiting. and They have to be because it's a positive feedback loop. Just like our voltage-gated sodium channels have to inactivate because they create a positive feedback loop, same thing here. Rather than having an inactivation gate, they just have calcium-gated potassium channels. Think of them as an amplifier. This way our lower motor neurons get sufficiently stimulated to cause muscle contraction. Because once we've come up with a plan, we want it to be executed. We don't want them to vote on this. This is what cancels any voting. We also have inhibitory inner neurons as well. These aren't there to act as amplifiers. These are there to help coordinate extensor and flexor activity so that you don't have co-contraction, unless you want it. You can always inhibit these to allow co-contraction, and that's what our Renshaw cells will do. 
But when you just think about typical movements, if you want to change the angle at a joint, you're going to want one muscle to relax and the other to contract. This way you get a change in angle. So it would be really nice if we had some circuit worked out so that when one motor neuron is active, the other is inactive. And that's what our inhibitory interneurons here are doing. They're going to innervate the antagonist lower motor neuron to provide inhibition. So when we look at our stretch reflex here, we tap our tendon, we stimulate the spindle afferent here. It's going to excite the agonist lower motor neuron we contract. We can lengthen this muscle because that spindle afferent also excites that 1A interneuron, that inhibitory interneuron that then decreases the output from that antagonist lower motor neuron. So it decreases the muscle tone and that allows this muscle to lengthen. If this doesn't lengthen, we don't kick. So those interneurons, the inhibitory interneurons, are there to make sure that our extensors and flexors aren't active at the same time. For the most part, that's their job. We have other inhibitory neurons called Renshaw cells that aren't going to be targeting the antagonist lower motor neuron. They're actually going to be targeting other lower motor neurons that are innervating similar muscle groups. So they have input from the lower motor neuron and they provide feedback onto it. So what this circuit allows for is selective activation of lower motor neurons. We have an amplifier built in that's going to increase excitatory drive to our lower motor neurons, but we still need some way of selecting the appropriate pattern in our spinal cord to get the appropriate movement. Renshaw cells are gonna help do that. They're gonna provide lateral inhibition here where when they are active, they're going to inhibit their neighbors. And only those nearby neighbors that are getting upper motor neuron input are going to remain active. So whenever we have descending input in the cortical spinal tract, we're exciting lower motor neurons and Renshaw cells help select the appropriate ones. Those that aren't receiving sufficient excitatory input are going to be shunted by the glycine that they release. So they'll dump glycine onto both of these motor neurons. Motor neuron one was being excited more so than motor neuron two. So this creates a greater signal to noise ratio. All three of these cells are getting excitatory input. When we stimulate motor neurons, we also stimulate Renshaw cells so they can inhibit the area to cut down on some of the noise. Lower motor neurons are always active to some degree, providing muscle tone. So whenever we want to have selective activation of lower motor neurons, well, that means we need to have selective inhibition. And that's what Renshaw cells are doing. They're setting a slightly higher threshold than you have to meet for excitation in order to actually fire your action potentials and communicate with the muscle. These can also innervate our inhibitory interneurons here to cancel out that extensor flexor circuit where only one can be active. What they'll do, these Renshaw cells, is inhibit this inhibitory neuron which will allow our two neurons to be active at the same time so that we can hold position constant at a joint. So we can get co-contraction of extensor and flexor to resist movement at that joint rather than create movement at that joint. We also have some more long distance circuits to consider, and some of these we already have. The only real new thing that we're adding this lecture would be our miserable interneurons. These are going to cross the midline. Now, rather than coordinating extensor and flexor activity, we're coordinating left and right. So that when we walk, one leg moves but not the other as opposed to hopping. So the commissural interneurons are going to provide input from one side to the other. And they're going to affect the activity of these spinal pattern generators here. So we've kind of simplified the excitatory interneuron. It just kind of synapses on itself. This is a way of just having one cell to represent multiple. Keep in mind there's multiple 
set of random neurons here. So here's our amplifier innervating our motor neurons so that we have some output on this side of the body. Here's the other side. We have our amplifier stimulating our lower motor neurons. We get output there. One side of the body is active, then the other. Then the one, then the other, then the one, then the other. So snakes can slither, fish can swim, we can walk. So these commissural interneurons make it so that when one side is active, that stimulates inhibitory input to all the other neurons on the other side of the body. So you get alternating behaviors. As we'll find out, some of our descending tracts are going to provide bilateral input. So just excitatory drive to both sides of the body. So we can do routine bilateral movements like walk around. You don't give this a lot of thought anymore these days because your spinal cord and your cerebellum have it all figured out. That wasn't always the case, but now it is. And the reason why our left and right work in an alternating fashion like they do, so here's a recording from the left side and right side simultaneously. What you'll notice here is that output on the left is only active when we're not communicating to the right side here. So these were done in a lamp read they're going to kind of slither around. So you can see the alternating left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right activity to allow them to slither. And that's because of inhibitory input from the other side of the body. So that when we're bursting here, we're also bursting some glycine and GABA to inhibit activity here. This is going to be self-limiting. That burst still turns itself off. We're still going to have calcium-gated potassium channels to shut all this off. And when that happens, our bilateral excitatory input excites the other side. And we burst some GABA and glycine over here to turn that side off. So only one side is active at a time. You can, of course, turn these off to allow both sides to work at the same time. Or you can let them work. So that you can just walk around. And you don't have to think left, right, left, right. Our spinal cord has it all figured out. So the two sides can be coordinated just like the two sides of a joint can be coordinated. And it's just inhibitory interneurons. Have I mentioned how great these are? Inhibitory interneurons, have I said that before? <laughs> these things are great. These have expanded far more throughout evolution than our excitatory neurons. And there's a reason. They create all these wonderful logical circuits to let our nervous system do a bunch of stuff for us that we don't have to think about. <sighs> but I could talk about that all day. I think we need to move on a bit. Um, so we still have input from our muscle spindles, from our tendons. This way we know the, the length of muscles, how much tension is on them. These are going to create our stretch reflexes. We'll see why those are so nifty in a bit. So we still have our 1A and, and, and 2 afferents. These are going to stretch. These are going to sense um, changes in muscle length and static muscle length, respectively. These are going to feed back onto the lower motor neuron that innervates that muscle, that same muscle, so the agonist lower motor neuron, and of course the excitatory inner neurons as well. We feed back onto the amplifier to make sure we're going to sufficiently activate that lower motor neuron. And we will excite an inhibitory inner neuron as well to make sure our antagonist muscle is inhibited. So when we tap on the tendon, stretch this muscle, it contracts and this one lengthens. The only reason we know that it's been stretched is because of the spindle afferent there. So this is our stretch reflex. The myotactic, myotatic reflex. There's an inverse myotatic reflex that's going to be stimulated by R1B afferents that innervate the tendons. When there's tension on a tendon, either through muscle stretch or more likely contraction, if R1B afferent is stimulated sufficiently, it's going to have the opposite innervation, you'll notice. Rather than acting on the agonist, we're going to excite the antagonist and inhibit the agonist. So this way you stop contracting that muscle that has so much tension on it to prevent tissue damage.
the spinal reflexes are always working. Except when they're not, of course. We can turn them off. And we need to. Because their purpose is to resist change. Uh, the players here would, of course, be our spindle afferent. Uh, the blue fiber here. Then we're going to have some motor innervation coming back to there. So there's our lower motor neurons, agonists, antagonists, and here's our inhibitory inner neuron. So we pour a little soda in. It gets heavier. That's going to weigh down on the hand. And we're going to stretch this muscle, but we didn't tell it to stretch, now did we? No. This is a passive stretch. When we stretch, we, gonna, we stimulate our spindle afferents. They're going to provide excitatory input to the lower motor neurons for the agonist muscle, the one that will stretch, and the inhibitory neuron that innervates the antagonist muscle. So that spindle afferent is going to resist any change in muscle length by exciting the stretch. Uh, muscle here and then inhibiting that antagonist muscle there. So as we pour our soda in to quench our thirst, we don't weigh the mug down and spill it. Spinal reflexes resist change. That's their purpose. So that I can stand here and, and, and not fall over. Part of the reason why that happens is because I'm not telling myself to do it. And since I'm not, any little change in muscle length gets canceled out. If there's a little stretch, contract it. If there's a little contraction, relax it. We have to override this circuit, in other, uh, in other words, if we want to have any movement. So that upper motor neuron input is going to do two things. The first thing that it's going to do is stimulate gamma lower motor neurons. Why are those going to get activated first? They're small. They sure do. Yes. But they're small. That's why they're activated first. Higher resistance. Now they do innervate the intrafusal fibers. So what they're going to do is cancel out the stretch reflex. They first turn that off. So when we have descending input, here's our cortical spinal tract. Notice we're in the lateral portion, so we're probably hitting a limb. Hey, we're hitting a limb. This all works. Nice. So the first thing we do is stimulate our gamma lower motor neuron. In this case, we want to flex. That's the movement that we're trying to execute here. So that gamma lower motor neuron innervates the spindle. When this neuron fires, what happens to the length of our spindle? Fantastic. Yeah, we're stretching the spindle. Pulling on the ends and that center gets stretched. What happens to the activity of our 1A afferent here? Exactly. Exactly. So we're, we're giving this muscle the illusion that it's elongating, but it's not. So we're going to let the spinal reflexes work for us. They're going to try to cancel out this movement, which is going to facilitate the message that we're sending in our cortical spinal tract, which is contract that muscle. So the gamma lower motor neuron tricks it into thinking it's been stretched when it hasn't. That 1A afferent is going to provide excitatory drive back onto that alpha lower motor neuron. And it needs a little excitatory drive because it's a little bit bigger. A little lower resistance. So we're going to facilitate activation of our alpha lower motor neuron by hijacking the stretch reflex here. And that's going to drive contraction. At the same time, we're inhibiting that extensor muscle, the antagonist. Now the cortical spinal tract is going to stimulate this inhibitory neuron, so is our 1A afferent, so we make sure that we're decreasing the muscle tone here, both in the extrafusal fibers, but also intrafusal. <laughs> so we're not just inhibiting alpha motor neurons, there's also inhibition of the gamma motor neurons as well. So what happens to the length of this spindle when we relax? Yeah, exactly. We're not pulling on it anymore. Those intrafusal fibers relax, so it gives this the illusion that it's contracting. So we're going to hijack that spinal reflex, take advantage of that, and it's going to cancel out that so-called contraction and allow lengthening.
just two neurons and all their friends. But that's it. When you don't want to move, you don't because we have all this logic built in. When you do want to move, we take advantage of what's already there, hijack it, and have it work for us. Whenever you have spinal cord damage, and we don't have this descending input, we're unable to inhibit our spinal reflexes. So what do we see whenever we <coughs> tap a tendon and get a deep tendon reflex? If it's, what's up? Exactly, yeah. It's pronounced, we have hyperreflexia, because these are just running wild. We don't have inhibition of them from our cortical spinal tract anymore. Any questions? Okay, I got a couple. Let's go through these and then we'll uh, move on to the non-conscious part. Well, let's see if we can build ourselves a circuit and then talk about how that thing works. Stephanie Snodgrass. Um, help me build this. So we got some inner neurons that are going to affect the activity of my motor neurons here. And, and we're just going to separate them based on extensor, flexor, and then different sides of the body. Give me an inner neuron and tell me what it's doing. Um, so you have the excitatory inner neurons. Okay. I'll make them green. Green is for excitatory. All right, tell me about those. What, what do they innervate? Um, they innervate Okay, great. We have this positive feedback. Sorry. This is Okay, we can read that now. Is that better? I'll make the silence is yes. Okay, so they innervate each other and okay, some lower motor neuron. Great, we'll we'll make it for the extensor. So what does this do? Or it may create some more robust activation. Okay, good. Does that make sense to everyone? Firing of one excitatory inner neuron leads to the firing of the other, leads to the firing of the one, the other, the one, the other, the one, the other, the one, the other. And they're going to provide excitatory input to the lower motor neuron all the while. So what this leads to, yeah, we agree. Would be a first of activity. Would you like to talk about another neuron, or would you like to pass on? I'll pass on. <laughs> Generous. <laughs> Callie, give me another uh, neuron in here and tell me what it's doing for us. excite our extensor, we're at the same time inhibiting the flexor. That seems nifty. Would you like to talk about another one or pass? I'll pass. Jess? Yeah. What other neurons might we have here? Um, we have the commercial neurons. 
Great. Our miserable inner neurons. What do those do? They cross the midline to coordinate left and right movement. So when one side is active, it's stimulating inhibitory input on the other side. Great. Uh, they can figure this out, what we're doing exactly for extensor flexor. They have their own circuit. Let's not worry about that. But whenever we have our excitation going on over here, if we're stimulating this extensor, we're most likely going to inhibit the other extensor and allow activation of its flexor. But much simpler, I think, just to consider that when one side is active, the corresponding network on the other side is inhibited. This way we get alternating movements, left, right, left, right. Anything else? Are there any other neurons? See some nods. Do they have a name? Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, Renshaw cells. But what do those do? <laughs> they're going to provide input to lower motor neurons, and they're going to cause selective lower motor neuron activation. So it's going to either inhibit or uh, it's going to inhibit the inhibitory inner neurons. They're in the threat complex. Oh yeah. Well, uh, if we if, if we want to have Co-activation of our extensor and flexor. Yeah, exactly. We can turn this thing off. This way they can both be excited. So we hold a, a position constant at a joint. Well, let's think about the other extensors over here. We don't care about them. We didn't draw them big enough to put anything in them. this motor neuron is activated, if we're not also stimulating these, the Renshaw cell is going to make sure they stay inactive. It's also going to limit the excitation of this neuron. So again, we're getting a burst. And then we rapidly come back to rest because of the Renshaw cell. So it's just recurrent inhibition right here in, in groups of neurons that perform some similar task to just kind of raise the bar for what, what the amount of excitation needed to actually fire your action potentials and cause some sort of muscle contraction. We're going to see lateral inhibition in several places uh, throughout this class. This is a common mechanism to allow selective neuronal activation. So probably best to get some understanding of it now because it will come up later in the retina and in the cerebellum, cortex, thalamus, Euler. Um, so by dumping glycine in this local area, that allows the excitatory input to stand out just a bit more. So we have better signal to noise. That noise would be inappropriate modern neuron activity. So we filter that out by just providing widespread inhibition. Okay, so we want to talk about keeping our <coughs> muscle length constant. So let's say we don't have any upper motor neuron input. Stephanie Smith? No. <laughs> Why don't we have a change in muscle length? Let's, you know, let's consider that there will be some little fluctuation in muscle length. Well, why don't we get any overt change in muscle length unless we want it to happen? Because of the muscle swivels and like the extra fusel fibers, they assess the length of the muscle and keep it from leaning or contracting. Okay, okay. So let's say we have an uh, inadvertent stretch. This is going to be sensed by a spindle afferent, you say? Yeah. Okay, great. Here it is. Is it going to be activated by this or inhibited by a stretch? Activated. 
Excellent. Simple drawing arrow like that. So we turn on our 1A acrid. Well, how does it affect activity here? Let's say that we have inadvertently stretched our extensor. Now what? I'm going to come in the dorsal root there, now I'm in the dorsal horn. What am I doing? What are the targets? of these spindle afferents. Thank you, Stephanie. So they're going to excite that extensor. And it's getting messy. So that whenever we stretch that extensor, we're going to contract it. Do we do anything at all with the flexor? The How? There you go. It's just that simple. And so now, if we were to stretch our extensor muscle, that spindle afferent is going to use our spinal circuitry here in order to robustly stimulate the extensor. This way it contracts. We didn't want it to stretch. Let's cancel that out. And we're going to inhibit the other side. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Excellent. So what if we do want to change in muscle length? Leo. We do want to change in muscle length now. There is input from our cortical spinal tract. What happens to allow all this to work for us? rather than against us. Um, the deal with the gamma. Ah, uh, now we got to think about a gamma motor neuron. Ooh. We have room. And we'll just consider the one for the extensor. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, where can we stick this thing? Let's just have it float out in space. Sorry. Here's our gamma lower motor neuron. So you say we're stimulating that? Yes, there's a small. Okay, great. Okay, so they're going to be active first. Okay, great. What do they do? And it inhibits the stretch reflex. How? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> All right, well, what kind of muscle fibers do they innervate? Okay, cool, those interfusive fibers there at the spindle. So what is the activity of this gamma lower motor neuron going to do the activity of my spindle afferent up there? Whenever those 1A, I'm sorry, whenever the gamma lower motor neuron causes interfusal fibers to contract, what happens to the length of the spindle? There you go. I knew you'd get there. So what this gamma lower motor neuron does is take our spindle, Here's our interfusal fibers, and here's the spindle. We have an afferent wrapped around that. When the gamma lower motor neuron causes the interfusal fibers to contract, that sensory portion gets stretched. So what the gamma lower motor neuron gives the illusion of is stretch. Notice it's in quotes. It's not really stretching. It has the illusion of stretch. So, we in a very roundabout way stimulate our 1A afferent here. This way, as we're exciting this alpha lower motor neuron, causing contraction of the muscle, we're causing a stretch of the spindle that cancels out the contraction that takes place from the extrafusal fibers. And this way, we don't have activation of our spinal reflexes. We cancel them out. When our extrafusal fibers contract, everything shortens. When our interfusal fibers contract, the spindle stretches. Stretch plus contraction equals nothing in this case. 
is when we don't have our spinal pattern generators here canceling out the input from the cortical spinal tract. Instead, they help drive that change. It's a beautiful system. Are there any questions on it? I'm sure you can draw this better. Please do so. Have it ready. But there's just a few things to think about. There's a couple different motor neurons, sure. There's a couple different inner neurons. I've just figured out how they link together and you'll have the whole world figured out. We move on. All right. In addition to the cortical spinal tract, there are other descending pathways that are going to influence activity of our lower motor neurons. Because these don't arise from the cortex, we're not aware of them. These are outside of our conscious awareness, but they are still certainly important. For the most part, these are gonna help us keep balance. They're gonna allow us to respond automatically to aversive stimuli like loud noises or pain. Or they're gonna help cancel out pain. We've already gone through that one. So we're going this time. Um, of these, the reticulospinal tract is probably the major one. Uh, to cover, if we just have to cover one. Um, your reticulospinal tract is going to arise from the reticular formation. This is a collection of brainstem nuclei that will get their own lecture later on. Lecture 18, I think. These are going to provide um, the widespread excitatory input to the cortex to keep us awake, but they also provide uh, descending tracts that help us execute well-patterned movements, things that we've already figured out. There are different groups of reticular nuclei that are going to innervate the extensor or flexor muscles, and the extensors tend to be in the pons, the flexors tend to be in the medulla. And when you're thinking of the reticulospinal tract, I hope that you'll think of well-patterned bilateral movements. That's what it's all about. Things that you do routinely that involve both sides of the body, like walking. Walking is going to be carried out by our particular spinal tract because we do it all the time. Once you've figured it out, you don't have to give it much thought. I doubt you've thought about your steps in a long time. Can you remember the last time you thought about left, right, left, right? I don't think so. I hope not. <laughs> that would be weird. They're going to create overt changes in muscle length. So when you hear that, you should think, well, they're going to inhibit spinal reflexes. And indeed, they do. That's what we're seeing here. They're stretching the muscle. And they're looking for some sort of response in the lower motor neuron and the 1A afferent there. They're doing this with stimulation of the reticular spinal tract and without. Compare stimulation of the 1A afferent. Any difference? Not really. Sensory input is about the same, but the motor output is different. That reticular spinal tract is going to inhibit the input of spinal reflexes so that we can have some over change in muscle length. Again, what this is going to do is well pattern bilateral movements. Here's a cat. Uh, this cat is special because they've severed the connections uh, with the cerebrum and the rest of the nervous system. So it's a decerebrate cat. From the midbrain up, no more axons, no connections. So this is just the reticulospinal tract allowing, and the spinal pattern generators, by the way, to allow the, the cat to have kind of this gallop whenever they turn the treadmill on. Now, 
because they've severed connections with the brain, it, it can't hold itself up. So they support its weight here with these little harnesses, and they're going to increase the treadmill rate. And you'll notice that its steps change. It goes from a walk to a gallop as it increases treadmill speed because it needs to run faster to keep up with that. No cortical input at all. And it doesn't need it. This cat knows how to walk. This is a well-patterned movement. Those things that are so simple, let's remove them from the cortex. It has a lot of other very important jobs. So something simple like taking steps, we pan that down to lower brain stem uh, structures like our particular formation. The activity in our reticular spinal tract just generates the same movement every time for the most part. It doesn't take into consideration sensory input. That's the job of the spinal cord. We have those spinal pattern generators to refine this basic input from the reticular spinal tract, that is to say, walk. Do we step forward? Well, that's what the reticular spinal tract would want you to do every time. Sometimes you don't want to just step forward, sometimes you want to step a little to the side. This doesn't do that. That's not a part of the pattern. It's always step forward. The reason that we think this is again through experiments with cats. So they're going to be stimulating the reticular spinal tract up here or the spinal cord locally and looking at this pre-patterned movement that is stepping, fictive walking, and they put it on a treadmill. That treadmill is going to provide sensory input. They can turn the treadmill so it's either in line with the cat, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, and look to see what's the pattern of movement that they generate whenever they stimulate in the reticular spinal tract or down there locally at the spinal cord. Well-patterned movements, very much privy to sensory input. And we'll see a difference in how they step. Here it is with the treadmill in line. Everything looks good. What they're doing is tracking the motion of the leg. Because the treadmill is in line with the direction of walking, whether you stimulate in the reticular spinal tract or down there in the spinal cord, you get the same step. This is a routine movement, and there's no need to deviate from it. There's no sensory input suggesting the step should work otherwise. When they turn the treadmill, now it's 90 degrees. When they stimulate in the reticular spinal tract, they're getting some inappropriate stepping here because the reticular spinal tract just wants the step to be the same way it always is. In order to break out of that pattern, we're going to need additional input. Typically, this will be from the cortex. If you're walking, you see that there's a curve there, so you step a little higher. You don't have the same sort of low step because you'll hit the curve. If you're walking up steps, you need to refine this well-patterned movement. You need to adjust it so that you don't fall down the steps. The reticular spinal tract is not about that. It's not about flexibility, it's about exhibiting a routine behavior. So, the cat tries to walk normally since they've turned this 90 degrees. What the reticular spinal tract wants to do is this. The treadmill pulls the leg down, it gives the same movement, and then goes back. It's giving it the same pattern that it always does, which is this direction. On the other hand, if you stimulate it in the spinal cord to get this pattern movement, notice it's in line with the sensory input. So for us to move around, for us to take these steps that are well patterned, we give the input from upon high, in this case the reticular spinal tract, and then we let the spinal cord figure it out. The spinal cord is going to refine that message, and it's going to make sure that the two sides work together, of course, because we have these commissural inner neurons. So there's just descending bilateral input to say, step, you figure out the rest. Part of that figuring it out is making sure one side is active than the other so that we step one leg at a time. Another part of that is allowing sensory input to affect the motor output. So, all that is to say, your reticular spinal tracts are going to stimulate well-patterned movements that involve both sides of the body. There's a bunch of other tracts too. Some of these we've already covered. Rapid spinal tract. Goes from the raphae down to the spinal cord. 
Does this ring a bell? Good. It should. This helps gain pain. We're going to dump serotonin out there in the dorsal horn. Tectospinal tract. Do you remember the spinal tectal tract? Goes from the spinal cord up to the tectum. I'm only glossed over that one. It's in the notes, though. Um, well, this is the reverse of that. So whenever we have aversive input, something is, is nibbling at our leg, activation of your anterolateral system, part of that is the spinal tectal tract, is going to then activate superior, inferior folliculi, that's for noise, this is for sound. These are going to control the movement of our head, so that something's nibbling at us, we turn and look. You don't have to think about it. Something's nibbling. That hurts. It's on my leg. Let me look. There's an automatic gaze toward any loud noise. Have you ever had a loud noise startle you? You turn and look for it. You don't think about it. You just do it. That's your type of spinal tract. These are going to control the movements of our head and eyes so that we turn toward aversive stimuli. The rubral spinal tract is very minor in, in humans. This is going to go from the red nucleus, hence rubro, on down to arm flexors. Uh, for lower primates and other mammals, this is a fairly important tract, uh, but not so in humans. Our cortical spinal tract has expanded so dramatically that this doesn't seem to actually do anything for us, other than allow us to localize a level of a lesion in a comatose patient. This is in the brain stem. It innervates arm flexors. If this remains intact, then the <coughs> arms will be flexed whenever there's damage to the cortical spinal tract, whenever there's damage above the brain stem. Our rubral spinal tract remains intact, so the arms flex. If the arms aren't flexed, that means that the rubral spinal tract was severed, so we have damage below the midbrain. Instead, we'll see this extensor posturing. That's because of input from lower structures in the vestibular spinal tract, which is down in the vestibular nuclei, so below the midbrain. Those are going to provide uh, descending input along two different tracts. There's a medial and lateral vestibular spinal tract. We'll hit those a little bit later. These are going to be controlled uh, by input from the vestibular system, also the cerebellum. And this helps us maintain balance. These are fairly important too. Medial vestibular spinal tract, this is going to be bilateral, muscles in the neck to help keep our head upright. The lateral portion will be ipsilateral, it's going to go down to the sensor muscles in the legs, the trunk to help keep us, again, upright. So these are about holding us up, balance. And that should make sense, vestibulo is built into it. So these receive input from the vestibular system, and of course the cerebellum and then they control those muscles that keep us upright, whether it's our head via the medial uh, vestibular spinal tract or the lower anti-gravity muscles in the lateral vestibular spinal tract. Any questions on that? These are certainly all secondary to the cortical spinal tract. That's the one that we control, that's the one that we're aware of. So let's go through these, and then we'll call it a class. Courtney. Hello. Hi. Okay, so um, the role in voluntary, it inhibits or reduces the impact of the spinal reflexes, okay. so then you can do voluntary motion. I like that. Anything else I might do? Um, what do we think? It's like the routine low pattern Bilateral. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Routine bilateral movements. That's what should come to mind here. Of course, we need to inhibit spinal reflexes because they resist change. And what is it that helps the two sides of the body work oppositely? Yeah. What are those things called? Okay, nice. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Visual neurons, just a misery. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, and hopefully you'll also think of cats as well. If you'd like to see some other strange things with cats, come by my office. <laughs> Okay. L. Yes. Um, tell me about the, the pattern of input from the reticulous spinal tract. In other words, ipsilateral, bilateral, contralateral, whatever it may be. Something about spinal pattern generators, which you've already heard a bit about. I just would like to have this type of neuron repeated. Um, and how it is that I, I haven't thought a bit about my walking, but I've been able to do it. Um, well, it doesn't go all the way up to the cortex, so it's not like conscious. Great. No cortex, not conscious. That's the lack of thought. This. Um, what's the question? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> What, what do the spinal pattern generators uh, do to affect this output from the reticulospinal spinal tract? Why don't we just start here? Tell me about the, the reticulospinal spinal tract. Compared to the cortical spinal tract, which is contralateral, how would we describe the innervation of lower motor neurons by the reticulospinal spinal tract? Uh, um, not contralateral? True. <laughs> True. Bilateral. Both sides of the body. That should make sense, because Courtney already told us well patterned movements that involve both sides of the body. That's what we should be thinking here. If you're going to control both sides of the body, you got to control both sides of the spinal cord. So it's bilateral. Well, why don't I hop when I want to walk? Um, because you can alternate it, like by inhibiting one side or the other. Fantastic. Yes, and we call those neurons? The commissure. Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> it doesn't require a whole lot of thought. Is it possible for me to ever change this pattern? Do I always take the same step? No. Why not? You can override that by like the cortex and like thinking for different motor patterns. Fantastic. So the cortex can override this. Does it look like the spinal cord maybe plays any role as well? Yes. Yeah. It'll take into account the sensory input and just give that last little bit of finishing touches there, the last edit uh, on, on that message before it goes out. This is just a general message. And of course, this is going to be recruited by the cortex. It's going to say, hey, let's walk. You'll walk because of bilateral descending input to the spinal cord from the reticular formation. And then the spinal cord figures all that out. Both sides of the body work oppositely because of those commissural inner neurons. And if there's a little bit of a change in the angle on the ground, there's some sensory input that requires some change from that typical pattern, now well, the spinal cord is gonna handle that. Not this. This creates a well-defined pattern. Do you have any more questions? All right, well, that's all I got for you. I'll see you next week. <laughs>